So in this video, I'm going to show you how to get started creating questions within Qualtrics. So as you can see here, I already have um, Qualtrics loaded up. I'm already into a project or survey, um, as it might be called. And so this is what you'll see when you get started there. Um, by default, you'll see a block of questions right here, which is just a, a set of questions, um, probably that would be related. And you'll see just one question that pops up here by default. And so that's what you should see when you get started. Uh, to show you a few things uh, first that you should set before you get into creating questions is this survey options menu. So I'm going to click this and then that brings up a whole list of options. You only need to change this once because it applies to the entire instrument or survey. Uh, but these are some kind of look and feel options that can end up being important for your data collection. So some options to draw your attention to. I'm not going to show you everything here, but up here is uh, an option for back button. So if you would like to include a, a back button so that your respondents can go revisit uh, earlier questions and change their answers, you would uh, select the checkbox here. By default, that is not checked uh, because oftentimes you don't want people to go back to be able to go back and change their answer. Um, survey title, if you want to change this, this just shows um, the text or this it will let you change the text um, that will appear in the in a browser tab or something like that up here. So you can change how that presents. Um, down here, some options that are going to be relevant for most people are prevent ballot box stuffing. So if you only want a person respondent uh, to be able to provide one response to your uh, survey, then you'll need to check prevent ballot box stuffing. How that works though is with an IP address. Uh, so it is not going to entirely prevent someone from taking the survey more than once if you have if you use an anonymous link for instance. Um, if you use a personal link then it will definitely only let them take one uh, or per respond one time. Um, but it, or um, it will not let them respond twice using the same device. So just keep that in mind. That's another reason to uh, maybe really think about whether you want to, would want to use an anonymous survey. Um, but anyway, continuing on, yeah, you're probably not going to want to use most of these options. Um, if you wanted to show a, so a custom um, end of survey message, you would select that here. Um, you would have to actually get that from your messages library. So you can't just like type something in here. You'll have to have a, an end of survey message saved in your message library, and then you'll be able to access it right here. Uh, most of the time, the default survey message is fine, or default end of survey message is fine. If for some reason you would like to show the respondent a summary of their responses, so actually present them with how they responded to all of the items on the survey once they've submitted it, you can click this option right here. Um, and then last here, or the last thing I'll show you here in the survey options menu is all the way down here at the bottom where it says partial completion. So um, by default, you'll see here, it says record responses in progress. So this would be a partial response or a response that has not been submitted. Uh, so the default says to record those as completed responses one week after their last activity. So what that means is if someone logs on and they answer, say, three questions out of 20, and then that partial response just sits there for a week. Anytime in that week, the person could come on and they would jump back into uh, the question where they started. So if they answered the first three questions and they left the survey, they access it again. They might, uh, they'll just go back to, to question three to begin with, and then they answer, say, five more. So they get through question eight, then they could come back and keep doing that. However, uh, after one week of not logging back on to um, proceed further into the survey, this will close that response out and make it a completed response, which means you'll just have a partial response in your final data. However, in some situations, you might want to extend this out because let's say that you're administering a survey and you're giving respondents a month to respond or something like that. What this means is if someone clicked the survey to enter it, took a look at it and said, oh, I have a month to respond, I'll come back to this in two or three weeks, this option here would record that as a completed response, even though they provided little or no data, and then they wouldn't be able to go back in and change it. So uh, my recommendation is 
to you know push this out a lot further so that you don't run into any anything like that and um, that would cause you to lose out on data that you would otherwise get so you can uh, change you know any of these options here so then once you've made any of the changes that you want to make you would just click save now you're set to go with all of those options now to get started with creating and uh, editing questions what we'll, what you see is here's question number one so if i click the area um, here around question number one you'll see this gets highlighted and some options pop up so here i can change the format of the question so what kind of question it is um, you'll see by default multiple choice is selected and you can click here and you can change to uh, you know a lot of different kinds of questions are available. My recommendation is always that your first question should be a, it's called a meta info question. Um, this is actually a question, like it says here, uh, it will not actually be displayed to the user. Um, and it says here, this question will record the recipient's browser information. So what that means is that when someone accesses um, your survey, then the Qualtrics in the background records what kind of browser they're using, what kind of operating system they're using, um, and all this other information that is really useful for troubleshooting. So that way, if some people tell you that they want to take your survey, but they're having a hard time uh, accessing it, having a hard time seeing it, something like that, there's a good chance that it has something to do with their software or device. Um, and so having this information will let you get a better sense of um, what those issues might be related to. So that's just a recommendation from me. So then let's say we want to create a new question. We can just go over here and you'll see that when you're hovering over here on the right side of the question, you'll get um, uh, you know two green pluses and a red minus. The red minus would be if you just want to delete this question. And then this would just be if you want to add a question before or add a question after. Or you can go down here and just create a new question. So you'll see by default, it comes up with another multiple choice question. But if we go up here to the question types, we can change this to all sorts of things. So descriptive text means you just type in a paragraph or whatever uh, information you want to convey to the respondent. If you are including a, like a sort of consent form or a landing page or something like that, you would type all of that into a text slash graphic question type or descriptive text. You can also, you know, you can use graphics, multiple choice, like I showed. There are different, oftentimes there are different formats. So you'll see there are many different formats of multiple choice um, that you can select from. So there's all of those. Um, the three that I'll show you here are multiple choice, uh, matrix table. So oftentimes if you're going to use the same response scale and ask people, uh, respondents, a number of related questions, thematically related questions, then you could bring up a matrix table and ask it that way. The nice thing about that is matrix tables are really efficient in terms of space, um, and it uses the response burden um, because the respondent can see that you're using the same scale repeatedly, and that means that they don't have to think quite as much uh, to give you a response. The other kind of question uh, that's going to be fairly common is text entry, and so it's just a a text box where the respondent would type something in. And as you can see, you can make it single line, multi-line, so that you can drag the size of it if you want. Um, essay would just make it larger. Um, a form means that there's just several repeated um, text boxes or um, password if you wanted to do that. But let's go back here to multiple choice since this is what most people are gonna be working with. So over here on the options, kind of just starting from the top. Um, some of these options you can change by going to the multiple choice question type and then uh, selecting a different format. Uh, most of the time you're probably going to be sticking with something like the default here though. But that's one way to change the appearance of the questions. Some other things you can do are here. It says number of choices. So this would be um, that you, by default, you see you have three choices. If you click plus, that adds a fourth option, fifth option, and so on and so forth. Um, also, if you're typing, if you're typing things out and you say choice four and you want another one, you don't have to scroll all the way over or drag over with your mouse and go, uh, so, you know, click that plus button. You can just hit enter and then it just automatically creates the, another one for you. 
over here, the next kind of set of options are where it says answers. So by default, single answer, which means the respondent can only select one choice. You could change that to multiples, and so you'll notice that instead of having the radial buttons, they become these square check boxes, and so this is a check all that apply uh, kind of a question. Then here for position, by default, again, it's vertical, which means that they're just listed uh, from top to bottom. You can also change it so that it's horizontal. The decision is up to you. Um, generally, though, the vertical style uh, eases the response burden a little bit because they only have to look in one part of the screen. Moving down here for validation options. So you'll see that there's force response, which means that the respondent has to provide an answer for this question in order to advance um, into the survey. You can also change it to request response, which is a little bit softer, which means that if the respondent does not provide an answer to this question and then they try to advance through the survey, that they'll get um, a a box will come up that says you didn't respond will you please respond and they but then at that point they can uh, choose not to still choose not to provide a response and go ahead and continue on uh, through the rest of the survey so here for validation type um, this is not used quite as frequently with multiple choice questions but um, we'll use this uh, option in a few moments when a uh, run through this with descriptive text. Then uh, down here there are options. Um, so you can see page break, so that would mean say that there's several questions and you uh, don't want to, instead of having the respondent see a large scroll bar or something over here on the right, say that you want to um, you know, just sort of break it up so that it feels like the, like the survey is not quite as long. You can add a page break uh, and that just means that the, they'll have to click the little button at the bottom to see whatever the next question is after this. Um, then when you see display and skip logic, that would be, that's those are more advanced options. That would be um, if you want to change or, you know, use this to um, uh, implement a skip pattern through the survey or uh, display logic. So if you want to pipe language in, you would do all of that with those options there. So that's multiple choice. Uh, it's all going to look essentially the same for the matrix options. Um, you'll see the number of statements, the number of scale points. Um, you'll see uh, some options for matrix type. So uh, Liker just means, you know, um, that you'll have a traditional kind of scale right here. Um, <clears throat> bipolar, uh, you know, you can see here where it's, you know, more towards this one, more towards that one. So they're sort of choosing between two options that you write. Um, same thing here with, you know, kind of answers, some other options for appearance, and then force response. And then the last thing here is text entry. So let's say you have a text entry box here. Um, aside from the appearance here with, uh, you know, how large you want the text box to appear, uh, for validation, do you want to force them to response, uh, to respond, excuse me. So let's say you want to force a response, um, or not, it doesn't really matter, but let's say that you're asking for, what is your zip code, for instance? And, you know, one could be asking zip code for, you know, whatever reason. Um, so for validation type, what that means is that you're programming something in or selecting an option so that Qualtrics will not accept the answer and allow the respondent to continue until they provide a specific kind of answer. So um, different validation types include length of response. Um, you can see character range, um, like, you know, meaning the number of characters. So um, you know, where a space counts as a character and every letter counts as a character and every symbol counts as a character, anything like that. Um, for content validation, this is actually pretty handy because in this case, if you're trying to collect a zip code, um, you need to make sure that it's a certain format. So you can select this option and then Qualtrics will not accept an, uh, an answer or a response to this question unless it is a valid postal code. You can do the same thing over here for these options you see. You can make it um, so that it has to be an, uh, a valid email address, you know, phone number, state, date, just a number, um, or text only. 
these uh, options are really handy for data collection because um, by prompting your respondent to input your input their response in a particular way, you can save a lot of time cleaning data on the back end because say you're interested in zip code and many people will type in their actual numeric zip code, but some people might type in say Chicago or Memphis or something like that where they're typing in a word instead of a number. And so what that means is that during the data cleaning process, someone's going to have to go through and make some decisions about how to treat that data. So that is how to get started with creating questions in Qualtrics. Um, if you want to preview what your survey or what your instrument is going to look like to a respondent, you can click the preview button right here and it's going to open a new browser tab for you. And then um, you're going to see how the your, your survey appears to uh, a respondent. And um, this right here, because this is in preview mode, it's actually going to show you this uh, question about the user agent. So you can just see what that information looks like. But then you can see the zip code here. Over on the right, you'll see that it shows um, what your survey will look like on a mobile device, namely a phone. And then the last thing uh, that I'll show you here is, say you want to save your survey, save your set of items. So what you can do here is you can go down to import export and then you could print a version of your survey you could just export it in a file format that you could re-upload to qualtrics at a later time or you can export it to word and so this will just create a microsoft word version of your survey which shows the question format and the response format and so that is how to get started in qualtrics